Hello, everyone. All right. Let's try this again. Granted, you're not going to see all the other failed attempts, but uh, I do apologize for all of the delays in getting this video up. I've had various technical difficulties. Um, as you can see, I'm trying something a little bit different with this one. Um, we'll see if this works. It's a little bit of an experiment. Um, the whiteboard uh, uh, technique that I used in the last series is not working with the space that I have um, available to me right now. So I am going to try to use uh, a different program. Uh, this is Paint. Very uh, uh, technologically advanced. Um, so we'll see if this works. Uh, if not, I may experiment with a few other options going forward. Uh, but today we want to continue our discussion of... Uh, uh, category and uh, then also use that to build into constituency and then really get into the meat of what is going to be um, syntax. Um, so we're going to start uh, developing a formal theory of constituency uh, which is um, uh, phrase structure rules uh, which are going to be represented in tree structures uh, which is going to be really what you would expect uh, with um, when you start taking a syntax class. So um, we're really going to start seeing uh, the first illustrations of some of our uh, syntax uh, today. Um, but I want to uh, revisit some of our discussion of uh, uh, category from last time. So remember we talked about some of the challenges of some of those sort of traditional, um, sort of semantic-based uh, notions of category. So we talked about why we may not want to utilize terminology or, uh, or definitions of noun that is based off of this notion of a thing being a person, place, or thing. Um, uh, so, you know, we, we looked at the noun assassination, um, which seems to fit more closely with the semantic definition of a verb. And this is not surprising given that assassination is actually derived from a verb. Today, uh, we'll expand on this a little bit. Um, so one of the things uh, we can do is we can look at what are referred to as nonce words. Uh, these are words that are invented uh, for the purpose of studying linguistic phenomenon. So these are um, made up words. They're words that have phonological plausibility, um, but they themselves aren't... Uh, they, they themselves aren't, you know, actual words presently in use. So I'm going to utilize the word blick. Uh, you know, and if it's currently actually a word that is beyond my uh, uh, lexicon outside, you know, maybe it's a new terminology for something. Great. Uh, I am unfamiliar with blick being used uh, as a word, but it is a perfectly viable English word. Uh, it follows all of the the uh, rules of English phonotactics, so it's a viable English word. Um, but it's not one that is, let's say, widely used, if it's used at all. So, um, if we encounter the word blick uh, in pure isolation, we probably wouldn't have a good sense of what blick meant or what its category was. Now, we would know certain things about Blick. We would know that Blick was not, in all likelihood, a new preposition. It was not a new determiner. Uh, it was not a new uh, uh, complementizer. Because these types of words fall into a class of category that we refer to as a closed class. So these are words that are very restrictive um, in introducing new terms. They, the, they're very slow to change. They're very slow to add or change new uh, to, uh, the, the, the words that are within them. Um, so uh, 
the the you know examples so we're not we're not going to invent a new proposition uh tomorrow and then suddenly that's going to catch on in the english lexicon and we're, we're going to have new prepositions and we can contrast these with our open class so open class words are words that are much more free in their ability to allow new introductions um so these are all and these tend to be the ones that also carry some more semantic content uh in the sentence uh you know obviously uh prepositions determiners uh do have a semantic role uh but that role is more functional um so the the connection between function and cl uh closed versus open class is pretty close to one-to-one -one, um though there are some exceptions particularly in pronouns now the uh uh so uh, things like nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, etc. These are our uh, open class words. So these are the things that we can add new terminology to. So we encounter this term, blick. Um, so what are the types of things that we're going to look for to tell us what the category of blick is? Well, we're going to look at its overall context. Um, so where do we see it? So if um, I have a sentence like, Miranda bought the Blick yesterday. Well, that's gonna tell me that Blick is most assuredly a noun because Blick is there serving as the direct object of the verb buy um, and it is uh, in a, uh, it's directly next to a uh, determiner, the. Okay, great. Um, if I have uh, a uh, sentence like Ali blicks daily, um, that's going to tell me that blick is a verb. Uh, because um, uh there uh, we have the agreement marker on Blick um, and it's in this position where it is right after a subject noun um, and then we also have this adverb daily. So we can sort of tell by again this distributional um, uh, this, this dis the, the distribution of, uh, of where things are occurring um, within the, the sort of sentential frame. So we can encounter new words and sort of determine their category um, that way. And in fact, this is what we're going to utilize to help us sort of define what it means to be a different, uh, for uh, something to be uh, uh, of a particular category, um, is that you occur within a particular frame. Uh, you occur within a particular uh, uh, distributional um, set. Um, so, uh, you know, again, we could encounter blick. Uh, potentially, it could be an adjective. Um, we would maybe encounter some ambiguity here. So, um, I uh, saw uh, Jose's blick book. Um, this gets a little ambiguous because their blick could be part of a compound noun or it could be an adjective. So, you know, it's not the case that this distributional, uh, evidence is, um, always perfect. Um, but it, it gets us pretty far. There are other types of, um, uh, uh, ways that we can sort of look at the um, the distribution. So different types of category uh, will accept or re um, different types of um, morphological marking. So things like ish will occur on adjectives. So if we saw, um, I don't want a blickish dinner, uh, there it very clearly is an adjective. Um, uh, 
Jose left very blickly. That's an adverb. Uh, we've already seen it with um, things like uh, uh, the agreement marker. Uh, but note that uh, it many times this uh, there's um, uh, phonological overlap. So uh, blix, if we just saw that in isolation, could easily be a plural marker or it could be an agreement marker. So. <clears throat> so we have uh, a, a sort of a sense of, uh, of, of category. So what can we do with uh, with that, what, what what can we do with this notion of category? So with with category, we can then start to expand to a notion of uh, constituency. And what a constituent is is a set of words that function together as a unit. Oh, I am somehow. Yes, you very clearly want to see my taskbar. I don't know how that popped up there. Um, uh, is a series of words that function together as a um, as a unit, um, and so we can look at different types of um, phrases um, and see whether or not they function together as a unit. So we can look again. Uh, let's take again. Uh, I won't use the nonce word this time, but. Uh, uh, Ali uh, practices daily. Um, so we can sort of examine what in there forms a constituent. So increase the size on this. So Ali practices daily. Um, it, this is going to be a, a relatively uh, small sentence, so it's going to be a little bit difficult for us to determine um, some of the different elements. Uh, but we can we can look at various pieces um, and see what are the what are the uh, the different types of things that we can uh, examine with this. Um, so we can do things like uh, we can pose questions that are different elements. So what does Ali do? He practices daily. Okay. Um, what uh, what does Ali do daily? He practices. Um, so we know that uh, so a word like practice is going to form a constituent, and practices daily is going to form a constituent. Um, but notice you can't get um, something like uh, well very easily. There's there's ways with a double question, but those are that's sort of a different category. You can't easily get Ali practices to the exclusion of daily. So you can't get um, uh, you know. What happens daily? And I mean, these sort of get a little fuzzy here. Uh, we'll move on to a different um, set of sentences where I think this is going to be a little bit clearer. So our sentence is, Mark eats big plates of romaine lettuce on Tuesday. And I've clicked away from. So again, we can examine um, the, the various constituents of the sentence. So we can say, we can ask the question like, what does Mark do? Well, Mark eats big plates of romaine lettuce on Tuesday. That's the answer. Uh, what does Mark do on Tuesday? 
he eats uh, big plates of romaine lettuce. Um, we notice that we can front different elements. So you can say, it is eat big plates of lettuce on Tuesday that, Rome, that Mark does. It's a little funky, but you know, if you're talking about Mark, you can kind of get away with that. Um, but you can't say something like, it's Mark's eat, it, it, Mark eats big plates of lettuce on Tuesday. Um, because Mark eats does not form a constituent to the exclusion of big plates of romaine lettuce. Um, and this follows from the sort of notion that Mark is the subject and everything down here is our verb phrase predicate. Um, we can also sort of look at the big plates of romaine lettuce, that's our object, and on Tuesday is an adjunct modifier. So there's other ways we can um, uh, sort of look at the various constituents within this. So there's different tests we can apply. We can try to passivize things. So with Mark eats big plates of romaine lettuce on Tuesday, that's a good test to determine uh, when we're looking at an object, uh, what the constituent is. So uh, big plates of romaine lettuce are eaten by Mark on Tuesday. That shows us that big plates of romaine lettuce form a constituent. Um, notice that um, the uh, um, the uh, n uh, notice that on Tuesday and uh, uh, big plates of or uh, eats um, can be interrupted by that that uh, uh, by the by phrase. We'll have to deal with that uh, kind of later in the term. Uh, we can do clefting. Um, so this is where this is the uh, uh, that it is. Um, so we can do it is big plates of romaine lettuce uh, that Mark eats on Tuesday, uh, but we can also do it with the whole verb phrase. It is eat big plates of romaine lettuce um, that Mark does on Tuesday. Or uh, you can even do it with the whole uh, verb phrase because the whole thing is constituent. Um, so it is eat big plates of romaine lettuce on Tuesday that Mark does. That one gets a little funky, but it's still pretty grammatical. You just have to think of a, of a context where that would, ha would, would occur. Um, Look at the Carney text for additional um, uh, constituency tests. Uh, the, the tests of constituency are going to really be important for us in determining uh, what our phrase structure rule, uh, what our phrase structure is. Because all phrase structure is, is a theoretic application, a theoretic approach to constituency. So the whole goal of a phrase structure grammar is to set is to take a uh, is to take constituency and apply it to a um, uh, uh, and, and uh, formally capture it uh, using using some rules. That's it. I mean, that's really what the, the core uh, idea is, is that we're trying to, to say uh, we want to be able to formally predict when something is a constituent and when something is not a constituent. Um, that's what phrase structure grammar is all about. So that's what we're going to uh, move to. So let's start by looking at this sentence. So again, uh, we've seen our, our, okay, so looking at this sentence, uh, we want to try to determine, uh, we already know what the constituents are, so we want to try to build some phrase structure rules. 
And I want to say here that we're not going to go through all of the different phrase structure rules today. I'm going to leave this uh, in part uh, as a challenge uh, for you to do independently. Um, and also we're going to, uh, for those of you that are uh, enrolled in my course, this is something that we're going to be doing uh, in the actual course um, uh, this week is uh, trying to come up with the different phrase structure rules of English. Uh, but I, we will go through a few examples here. Um, so I want to start off by looking at the noun phrases. So um, we have, uh, I want to start off by uh, looking at the way that we write a rule. So uh, a rule is composed of a few different elements. Uh, a rule is going to have a um, uh, the name of the constituent on the left followed by an arrow. Uh, and this is telling you what are the possible uh, pieces within the uh, uh, constituent, uh, within within the phrase. Uh, uh, yeah, with, I mean, within the constituent, that's, that's correct, but also uh, within the rule, within the, the, so in this case, we're looking at a noun phrase. So we, we can start with our noun phrase, Mark. Um, so Mark is, an, is a simple noun phrase, and it contains a single element, a noun. And this seems to be uh, a pretty good start. We want um, our noun phrase to contain a noun. Uh, that seems right. Uh, and we can also uh, draw what this would mean. This is why I have this fancy program. Get my drawing ability here. I'm not the best artist, but let's see if I can make my lines a little thicker. That's better. So we have a noun phrase going to a noun. Um, and then that noun is Mark. Easy peasy. Um, we have other options of what uh, a noun phrase can be composed of. So we have this much more complex noun phrase, big plates of romaine lettuce. So we know that a noun phrase can be composed of more elements. A noun phrase can be composed of um, well, again, we know it must at least contain a noun. Um, but then we have this thing, this element here, big. Well, big is the category adjective. Now, we don't want to just put an adjective right in front of this. We don't want to just say, okay, well, it can contain an adjective. Um, we're going to argue generally that the, the types of elements that combine together are phrases. Um, they're going to run into a few exceptions for now. We're going to ultimately be able to correct this, but we'll see a few exceptions to this. Um, but there's good reason to think that this is an adjective phrase. Um, we can modify big uh, if we wanted to, which again is suggestive that this is this is a whole phrasal element. So we could uh, say Mark eats very big plates of romaine lettuce. Um, notice as well that I put the adjective phrase in uh, parentheticals. So to be a noun phrase, one needs to contain a noun, but one need not contain the adjective phrase. That That is an optional element. That's sort of the core of these phrase structure rules is that we're going to capture the, the core elements that are required and uh, uh, then sort of leave aside the elements that are that are not that, that are not required, or not leave aside. Excuse me. Uh, we're going to make them optional. The elements that are not required. Um, we can then uh, notice that uh, after plates we have of romaine lettuce. Um, so that is the category prepositional phrase. So we will go ahead and uh, uh, add that as well. Now, I want to note, uh, make a note about on Tuesday. On Tuesday is um, not part of this noun phrase. It is a prepositional phrase. And it is possible that we could um, have additional prepositional phrases. And we'll talk about this more 
uh, next time. Um, but on Tuesday is modifying um, when he eats. It's not modifying the plates. And we're going to uh, utilize what's referred to as the principle of modification to deal with constituency modification, the, the, to deal with the role of where things are in terms of uh, inside of phrase structure rule. So on Tuesday, modifies eats. Therefore, it is within the constituent of eat. Uh, we'll talk about this as a in, in terms of a formal relation soon. Um, of romaine lettuce is modifying plate. Uh, so it is inside the constituent. It is, it is directly inside the constituent that contains the plate. So uh, for now, uh, these are, are going to be, this is, you know, the, these are the, the rules that we need to capture um, the, the, um, uh, the noun phrases uh, mark and big plates of romaine lettuce. We also have the noun phrase romaine lettuce. Uh, that one's a little tricky. Um, it probably could actually just be captured by NP goes to N because that's probably a compound noun. Um, so we could probably just treat that as a single unit or we could treat it as adjective phrase uh, followed by noun. So this, uh, the all of our noun phrases are presently captured by these rules. Um, that said, this absolutely does not capture all of the noun phrases of English. And again, I'm going to leave you with um, that as a uh, as a means uh, as, as things to think about and we will we will revisit this some tools that you may want to utilize are the ability to um, add uh, additional elements uh, with this plus symbol so uh, in certain instances it is possible for us to repeat uh, elements essentially infinitely. So perhaps we can have as many adjective phrases as we would like preceding a noun. Um, and we would n indicate that with this little plus symbol. So these are our noun phrases. Uh, I'll go ahead and draw up our tree for uh, big plates of romaine lettuce. Though we haven't gotten to all of the constituents that contained within it, uh, we'll get we'll get there. So we're going to have a noun phrase. Let's find a good spot for this noun phrase. It's going to have a adjective phrase. It's going to have a noun. It's going to have a prepositional phrase. And we still have to do our account of our adjective phrase and our prepositional phrase here. So our noun is plates. So expanding on this, uh, what are our rules for a uh, an adjective phrase? Well, we are going to, much the same, have a rule that says an adjective phrase can go to certainly an adjective. That seems to be required. Uh, notice, uh, though this isn't part of our sentence, I did mention the possibility of a, a modifier. So we can seem to allow uh, adjectives to take adverbial phrase modifiers. So that, that those are the instances where we get very big. It's not in our example here, but uh, it does seem to be allowed. Um, so this is our adjective phrase rule. Um, this, this rule will actually carry us pretty far. So we can go ahead and draw this one, get our big plates. I want to uh, note something right now um, that I'm doing when I draw these trees, uh, and this is pretty 
relatively important. Uh, notice that I'm not drawing a line between the uh, lexical category and the the word the that the lexical category represents. Um, and this is actually relatively uh, important uh, because that line actually represents the uh, the fact that there is uh, the application of a rule. And there is no rule that we're using that says adjective equals big, uh, noun equals plate. That's not a rule of our uh, of our grammar. Um, it actually was, uh, if you go back to the like uh, early Chomsky 1950s uh, grammar, uh, those were rules, and you will actually find trees uh, in, in that era that have that because um, you had phrase structure rules that basically had a noun and then a list of like all the possible nouns. But we've since moved past that. And so it is technically incorrect to have that line. Um, and so you really should avoid that line. Now, there are many, many uh, programs out there that aid people in doing tree drawing. And unfortunately, most of them uh, by default include that line. Uh, but that line is incorrect um, uh, for the reasons I just uh, outlined. Um, and it remains incorrect even as we, uh, as we, update, uh, as we update the um, uh, the uh, uh, account that we're going to be giving throughout this uh, throughout the term. So uh, do avoid that line. Okay, uh, we're going to now need a account of our prepositional phrase. So prepositional phrases are going to be relatively easy. We're going to have a prepositional phrase go to. In this case, we have uh, we have two prepositional phrases, and they're really both composed of a preposition um, followed by a noun phrase. And what's interesting here, uh, at least for our purposes, is that both elements do seem to be mandatory. Now we can, we've looked at some instances of particles and whether or not those are preposition, eh, we'll, we'll focus on that later in the term. For, for now, our prepositional rule, our prepositional phrase rule is really gonna make this uh, mandatory. I'm, I'm realizing that these two things kind of bled together. Hopefully that's clear enough. Um, so we will draw this out. And this will get us our full. So we're going to have a preposition here. And this is of. We're going to get a noun phrase here. And this is going to be main lettuce. And so that's our noun phrase. Uh, let's move on to the verb phrase. Now the verb phrase is going to ultimately, our verb phrase rule is going to be very complicated. We'll see this again. We'll see this next time. So uh, we have eats big plates of romaine lettuce. So let's again look at what elements I'm going to change color just so this is a little bit clearer. So we know that the verb phrase has to contain a verb. It contains the verb eats. Uh, we know that it, that this particular verb phrase contains a noun phrase, which is this noun phrase right here, um, this one big plates of romaine lettuce, but not all verb phrases need to have this. So we're going to put that in that in those parentheticals. Um, and then it also contains an optional prepositional phrase. So this is going to, this is the rule that we're going to write for now, which is going to capture this verb phrase. Now again, this is only for this verb phrase. These, the, the verb phrase rule is going to be one of our most complex rules. Um, it, there's a lot of pieces to it. But this rule will let us draw the tree for our verb phrase, which is where we're going to close off for today. So we have a verb phrase, which is going to contain these three elements. It's going to contain our verb, 
which is eats. It's going to contain our noun phrase. And it's going to contain our prepositional phrase. And our noun phrase is exactly this noun phrase right here. So we're just going to copy that over as best we can. So we have our adjective phrase. And remember, this is an adjective phrase, not an adjective. We have our noun. We have a prepositional phrase. And then up here, we're going to get another prepositional phrase. That's wrong. That should be a preposition. Whoops. Oopsie doo. Uh, there we go. On another noun phrase. That is our verb phrase right there, following that rule. Okay, so there we have some of our first taste of um, uh, phrase structure grammar. Uh, we will start uh, doing a little bit more with phrase structure grammar in our next video. Um, and we'll uh, start working towards building uh, entire sentences and also looking at some instances of ambiguity and how we can use phrase structure rules tree structures to analyze ambiguity. Um, as always, I want to close off uh, with a quote. This one is from the Roman philosopher Epictetus. Uh, it is impossible for someone to learn what they believe they already know. All right. Um, again, uh, thank you all. I hope you all are uh, safe and healthy during this continued ongoing crisis. And uh, I will see you next time.